So our first licensee was, uh, it must have been about 69, 68, 69. You say it blossomed, uh, thinking back, it was pretty hard work. Um, it was not until about a, at least a couple of years later that we got some more people. We did a lot of journeys to Japan, of course, because that's where most of the world's hi-fi was being built. But you know, persuading people to come on board with what was really a new standard, you know, it took a lot of time. You know, people were rather wary about this system because it was, uh, you know, it was an encoding-decoding system, and what can we do about the encoded product? You know, uh, what's going to happen when that's played on machines which don't have decoders? So getting through that concept was extremely difficult. Gradually, uh, we started with the, the actual hardware itself and we got people on board, like Hitachi was a very early licensee, and so indeed was, uh, was Studio Revox. Um, we went and made a presentation to Studio Revox, and it was extremely interesting, they listened to it, and then uh, Willie Studer said, checkbook please. <laughs> In came the checkbook and he signed the introductory fee that we set up by then. Um, some people took a lot more convincing than that. <laughs> the really key thing came when we persuaded some of the pre-recorded tape manufacturers to introduce uh, encoded tapes. And this was a battle in itself because companies would say, well, we can't have two tapes, one encoded and one not, for the people, the vast majority of people who do not have um, decoders at home. And we said, well, you know, we don't think you need to do that. And they said, of course we would, you know. And so they began to make some experiments um, of this. And uh, interesting, simultaneously, Decca in England and Ampex Stereo Tapes, which was a very large uh, manufacturer in uh, near Chicago at the time, uh, making uh, pre-recorded cassettes, um, made some trial cassettes with side A or one of the sides had noise reduction and the other side did not and then sent these out to their normal reviewers and said what do you think of this and about 99% came back and said we far prefer the encoded side and the reason sort of in hindsight is fairly obvious and there are two things uh, first of all people like brighter sounds than dull sounds but more importantly is that in those days the average cassette recorder had a frequency response which sort of went like that very sharply curtailed at high ends, partly by design to remove the hiss, and partly because that's what the state of the art was in terms of heads and tapes and so on. So that our encoded tape, which had a frequency response which more looked like this, compensated quite well uh, over quite a wide range of levels with the uh, pre-recorded tape. Uh, so it was actually making the tape sound more like the original sound than less like it. Um, so once they got over their surprise, both Ampex and Decca started issuing just encoded tapes, and that was a big breakthrough. And shortly after that, our last major um, holdout against becoming a licensee, Philips, uh, became a licensee. And the reason why Philips held out for so long was as the inventor of the cassette, they were really very concerned about standardization. And in their minds, we were changing this standard. And so it became a, a, a de facto standard in any cassette recorder which were, had any aspirations to quality. Of course, it was still very, very much less uh, in terms of quantity than, non, um, than cassette decks without noise reduction. And when you're talking down about $25 or less you know, for a cassette deck. Uh, you just couldn't afford to put it in, but you, and also you didn't need to. Nowadays the, system, uh, the situation is very different because many of our technologies have become mandated um, parts of, uh, of a complete standard. <laughs>